Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Most ghosts are passive, or even benevolent, seeming to scare people only by accident, never by intent. Ghosts that were violent, however, also known as poltergeists, are in a class by themselves. Some of these malevolent spirits have actually killed people, and the most famous cases of violent hauntings have inspired multiple books and movie adaptations. This episode of Weird Darkness looks at some of the most vicious and violent true hauntings around the world and throughout history. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is a Dark Archives episode of Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com, where you can find the daily podcast and all social media that I'm on, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, MeWe, and others, along with the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into this Dark Archives episode of Weird Darkness. The Enfield Poltergeist You might think you know this one, if you've seen The Conjuring 2, but like most movies, it embellishes some of the details for dramatic effect. Nonetheless, The Enfield Haunting remains one of the most violent episodes of ghost activity in modern times. The trouble started on the night of August 30, 1977, when the Hodgson's brothers' beds began to wobble on their own. The next night, their mother Peggy heard a loud noise coming from the children's room and entered it to find a chest of drawers moving all by itself. She wasn't able to stop the heavy oak chest as it moved toward the door and concluded that some invisible force was at work in the house. Before long, the Hodson family's youngest daughter, Janet, became the focus of paranormal activity in the house. It seems she had been possessed by the ghost of the house's previous resident, Bill Wilkins, who died of a brain hemorrhage in the home before the Hodgsons moved in. Janet was often levitated by the alleged spirit, who also spoke through her in a creepy male voice, sharing details of his death. Objects flew through the air, family members and visitors were physically assaulted, and matches were spontaneously lit by the restless spirit. Some people dismissed the case as an elaborate hoax, but several eyewitnesses uninvolved with the Hodgsons came forward with stories to corroborate their claims. One of them was a policewoman who signed an affidavit attesting that she had seen a chair levitate and move on its own in the house. The activity died down after a priest visited the home in 1978, but it never stopped completely. Although Janet was never possessed or otherwise targeted again, the family continued to be plagued by strange noises in the night. The Nameless Horror of Berkeley Square Most people think of hauntings as something ghosts do, but the entity haunting 50 Berkeley Square in London, England proves it's a job for monsters as well. The earliest verified account of the horror dates from the 1840s when a 20-year-old Sir Robert Warboys took up a dare to spend the night in a creepy house which had already been the subject of scary rumors for years. He went in with a gun and a candle and a guard stationed outside just in case. He never came out alive. Late in the night, 
the guard heard sounds of a struggle, followed by a gunshot. When he got to Warboy's room on the second floor, he found the young man had died of fright. A second, better documented incident occurred a few decades later in 1887. This time, two sailors, Edward Blunden and Robert Martin, found themselves without a place to stay on Christmas Eve and so decided to crash in the empty house on Berkeley Street. Martin was able to get to sleep but was awakened in the night by the sound of Blunden fighting something. Martin saw a scene that caused him to flee the building in terror. Blunden was being strangled by a brown, formless shape that had tendrils, one of which it was using to strangle Blunden. These tendrils, or tentacle-like appendages, have led some to suspect the entity is not a ghost but a semi-aquatic predatory cryptid phenomenon that's coming up from the London sewer system. Martin ran from the house and returned with a police officer only to find that Blunden had been thrown from the second story of the house and crashed on the street below. In another version of the story, Blunden's mangled body was found at the basement at the foot of the stairs. The house is still there today and hosts an antiquarian bookshop on the first floor. By police order, no employee or customer of the store is allowed to explore the building's upper floors, though they do report strange noises from that part of the house. It's probably for the best, since the creature, or whatever it is that lives upstairs, has already claimed at least two lives so far. The Haunting of Maria Jose Ferreira Maria Jose Ferreira was just 11 years old when she became the target of an incredibly vicious poltergeist, and she did not survive the ordeal. It happened in Japotacabo, Brazil in 1965. The angry spirit manifested stones and bricks out of nowhere and targeted little Maria with various physical assaults, including scratches slaps and bites, leaving her constantly bruised. A visit by an exorcist did little to help. In fact, it seems to have provoked the spirit even further to the point where it was setting Maria on fire in public places in full view of many witnesses unconnected to the family. A visit to a spirit medium revealed the source of the poltergeist's animosity. Maria had apparently been an evil witch in a previous life, and was now being tormented by the spirits of people her previous incarnation had sent to their deaths with black magic. The medium beseeched the spirits to leave the innocent girl alone, but to no avail. Maria returned home and continued to be tormented until she sadly took her own life with pesticides. After her death, the manifestations stopped. The Bell Witch The legend of the Bell Witch has been described as America's greatest ghost story, and some versions of the tale even involve a future U.S. president. That last bit is likely an embellishment, but some claims about the story are known for certain. In the early 1800s, the Bell family settled in what would one day be Adams, Tennessee, near the Red River. John Bell and his wife Lucy had three children. Elizabeth, nicknamed Betsy, was born in 1806, Richard in 1811, and Joel in 1813. They also apparently had a very powerful spiritual enemy. Beginning in 1817, John and daughter Betsy became the targets of violent attacks by an invisible entity that eventually began speaking to them. Kate, as the spirit came to be called, would slap, bite, scratch, and otherwise assault everyone in the family from time to time, but seemed to hold special animus towards Betsy and John. Before long, the spirit's manifestations became accompanied by curses, one of which supposedly killed John Bell in 1820. The Bell Witch legend was so famous in its own time that the family's quest for help is said to have reached the ears of future U.S. President Andrew Jackson who came to visit the home with his men, armed with silver bullets to protect themselves. But like all others who tried to help the Bells, they were driven away by the vengeful spirit. 
Eventually, Kate gave up her vendetta against the Bells and is said to have retreated to a cave on their old property where hauntings and bizarre occurrences continue to be reported to this day. Elisa Lamb and the Cecil Hotel It's one of the creepiest unsolved mysteries in Los Angeles history, but the death of Elisa Lamb at the Cecil Hotel wasn't the first time this building had been associated with strange deaths. Indeed, the hotel has a long legacy of murder and the macabre, which is one reason it became the inspiration for American Horror Story Hotel. Elisa Lamb's case is exceedingly hair-raising, even to skeptics. Security camera footage shows she spent almost four minutes in an elevator, alternately talking to and trying to hide from someone who is not there, maybe just invisible. All the while, the elevator doors don't close, staying open much longer than they're designed to. She then leaves the elevator and presumably goes to her doom. She was reported missing shortly afterwards, and eventually her body was discovered in the hotel's rooftop water tanks after hotel residents complained about the water's taste and color. There is no plausible way Elisa could have gained easy access to the water tanks, and despite the fact that the coroner ruled her death an accident, it sparked numerous conspiracy theories, one of them being that she was either possessed by or trying to evade one of the spirits who haunt the Cecil Hotel. Elisa's is only the latest in a long series of strange deaths and macabre incidents at the Cecil. Almost from the beginning of the building's history, it has attracted violence and tragedy. In recent times, the Cecil Hotel was the home of two serial killers, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, and later his admirer and copycat, Jack Unterweger. And it is said that the Cecil Hotel is the last place Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, was seen alive. So it's not a stretch to think the place might have some spirits lingering about who aren't very friendly. Keep listening. More violent mysteries and hauntings of history will continue on Weird Darkness up next. I'd like you to meet the newest member of our weirdo family. Meet Cyjack, a female Arctic wolf. While visiting the Wild Animal Sanctuary in Keensburg, Colorado, Robin and I fell in love with the place and their mission to save the lives of animals from abuse and neglect. I immediately felt drawn to Cyjack upon seeing her and decided to adopt her in the name of Weird Darkness. And that means you had a part in that, weirdos. Cyjack was born in a safari park that couldn't care for her. But the Wild Animal Sanctuary steps in to save Cyjack and other wild animals from private owners and less-than-ideal living conditions. Cyjack now has a lifelong home in a large acreage, natural habitat near other wolves. Wild Animal Sanctuary has saved numerous other wild animals from abuse and neglect – lions, grizzlies, tigers, panthers, and more. Visit WildAnimalSanctuary.org to learn more, donate to the sanctuary, and maybe adopt an animal of your own, like we have with Cyjack. That's WildAnimalSanctuary.org. The South Shields Poltergeist The South Shields Poltergeist is a recent case of spiritual harassment and assault where the entity seemed to have a fetish for toys. Specifically, the toys belonging to a three-year-old boy which the spirit used to terrorize the boy's parents. It started like a pretty standard haunting. In December 2005, Mark and Marianne, a couple living with their young son Robert in South Shields, England, began to notice strange things happening in their house. Furniture moved by itself. Doors opened and closed of their own accord. Chairs would be found stacked in bizarre configurations. Then it got nasty. One evening, while they were in bed together, Marianne got hit in the back of the head with one of her son's toys. But Mark was beside her, and there was no one else in the room. The couple then tried to fight off an invisible entity that tried to steal their blanket. The encounter ended when Mark felt a searing pain on his back, 
and 13 red scratches appeared on his skin. That's when the poltergeist's toy fetish fully manifested. It left a rocking horse hanging from a ceiling fan. Mark and Marianne found a stuffed rabbit sitting in a toy chair at the top of their stairs with a box cutter in its lap. Malicious messages began to appear on their son's doodle board and even their cell phones, always from untraceable sources, saying things like, go die or you're dead. Sometimes young Robert would go missing for long periods of time, only to be discovered hiding in strange parts of the house like closets and cupboards. Paranormal investigators were called in who claimed to witness several incidents themselves and even to have seen the entity manifest. They described it as a midnight black three-dimensional silhouette that radiated sheer evil. And then, as abruptly as it had begun, the haunting stopped. Thus far, nothing further has been heard from Mark and Marianne or the house where they lived. The Black Monk of Pontefract Yorkshire, England, 1966. The Pritchard family wasn't expecting trouble, and at first the haunting seemed fairly innocuous. Strange noises now and then, the occasional chair moved around, that sort of thing. But sometime around August of that year, the entity at work in their home at 30 East Drive on the Checkerfields estate decided to ramp up the horror. Like many poltergeists, the thing focused a great deal of attention on children, in this case the Pritchard's daughter, Diane. She was thrown from her bed and at one point dragged up the stairs by her neck, leaving welts and bruises in the form of a handprint. The entity began to manifest itself visually in the form of a dark-robed figure that hovered at the feet of family members' beds. And then, also like many poltergeist cases before it, the haunting stopped abruptly, never to resume. Years after the events, a paranormal investigator discovered that the Pritchard's house lay on the former grounds of a medieval rectory and across the street from an old gallows where many people had been sent to their deaths over the centuries. Among those hanged there in the past was a Cluniac monk who'd been convicted of raping and murdering a young girl not much older than Diane had been at the time of the haunting. Based on this information and the entity's description, it was concluded that the haunting of the Pritchards was carried out by this monk's angry ghost who lost interest in Diane after she became too old for his sick desires. The Black Monk now had a moniker and went down in the record books as one of Europe's most violent hauntings. The Great Amherst Mystery the case of Esther Cox and her virtual posse of abusive ghosts is one of the most famous haunting accounts in all of ghost lore. It centered around Cox and her home in Amherst, Nova Scotia, Canada, beginning in 1878. It seems to have been triggered by Esther surviving a sexual assault by a male friend. This, understandably, left Cox in great emotional distress, and there may have been a connection between that and the events that followed. There were knockings and bangings in the night, and Esther's body began to swell as she alternated between high fevers and periods of very low body temperature. Then objects in the house began to fly around. The doctor who was called in to help Cox witnessed her bedclothes being moved, heard scratching noises from an undetermined source, and saw the words, Esther Cox, you are mine to kill, appear on the wall at the head of her bed. Esther tried moving to other houses, but whatever foul entities haunted her followed along. Among their tactics were the setting of small fires, one of which burned down Cox's host's farmhouse and resulted in her serving jail time for arson. It would have been easy to chalk this all up to mischief on her part, but the problem is that multiple credible witnesses saw several of the events happen while Esther was under close observation. Eventually, attempts to communicate with the spirit through seances and spirit rapping revealed that there were at least five different ghosts following Cox around for unknown reasons. 
the phenomena died down after Esther's jail sentence in 1879 and eventually ceased altogether. Esther Cox went on to marry twice and have sons from each marriage, and whatever had plagued her seemed satisfied with the damage it had already done. The Ghosts of Greyfriars Cemetery Lord Advocate Sir George Mackenzie, known to his victims as Bloody Mackenzie, was a vicious war criminal and torturer in the service of King Charles II. He imprisoned and tormented thousands of dissident Presbyterians in Scotland during the King's attempt to unify the country under one state religion. He carried out his grisly work at Greyfriars Kirkyard, a small cemetery of the Greyfriars Kirk Parish owned by the Church of Scotland. Hundreds of his victims were buried there and, ironically, so was Mackenzie himself when he died in 1691. He stayed buried until the 20th century, but then, one night in 1998, a homeless man seeking shelter disturbed Mackenzie's mausoleum and unleashed one of Great Britain's most well-known poltergeists. The homeless man himself fell through a hole in the floor of Mackenzie's tomb into a forgotten chamber that housed the remains of plague victims. This sent him screaming into the night, never to be heard from again. The next day, a woman looking through the iron gates of the cemetery was blasted back off its steps by a cold force. Shortly thereafter, another woman was found unconscious near the tomb, with bruising on her neck, indicating someone or something had tried to strangle her. Since then, there have been over 500 reports of ghostly attacks near Mackenzie's tomb, including burns, skin gouges around the neck and abdomen, unexplained bruises, broken fingers, punches, kicks, pulled hair, strange smells and sounds, and wall and floor knocks, many witnessed by multiple witnesses. Some people even claimed the ghost had followed them back home or to a hotel to continue the torments. The only person who ever tried to exorcise the restless spirits from the cemetery failed and was found dead a few days later. To this day, the ghost, presumed to be that of Bloody Mackenzie himself, reigns supreme in the area and shows no signs of either leaving or getting any nicer. Hatred, it seems, never dies. The Coventry Dog Killer In 2001, a family in Coventry, England, uploaded a video that showed a closet door opening and a chair moving about the room with no apparent assistance from the living. The family's mother, Linda Manning, claimed the ghost responsible had also killed the family's dog by pushing the poor thing down the stairs. Desperate for help, the Mannings called in famed medium Derek Acora, who claimed the poltergeist was an angry spirit named Jim. After conducting a spiritual cleansing of the home, Akora and the Mannings were happy to report that all poltergeist activity had ceased. You think this case isn't as bad as some of the others, but think of the dog. Nobody likes a bully, and entities who go after kids and animals are the lowest of the low, whether living or otherwise. Keep listening, there's more weird darkness to come. When I was younger, I treated my body like I was invincible. But the older I get, well, the more I realize how wrong I was. Fortunately, my bad back and bad knee aren't as much of an issue now thanks to CBD oils that I get at WeirdDarkness.com slash CBD. Studies have shown that CBD can help with depression in many cases as well. It certainly has for me. There are numerous ways to use CBD oils. Bath bombs, body rubs, muscle creams, face creams, candy bars, powder for cooking, even pet products. Products. Plus, all of their products come THC-free, so you don't have to worry about psychotropic properties like other hemp-related products. If you're a CBD user already, or if it's something you want to try, visit WeirdDarkness.com CBD and take a look at all the products available. That's WeirdDarkness.com CBD. And remember, use the promo code WEIRD15 at checkout to save 15% on your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com CBD. CBD. 
somewhere in England, 1984. As he hoisted the orange bag full of newspapers onto his shoulder, 12-year-old Jake felt an enormous sense of pride sweep over him as he was about to start his first proper job. It was an opportunity to earn money that wouldn't be coming from the pocket of his parents for second-rate efforts at washing up and keeping his room tidy. He lifted his bike up from the driveway and looked back to the house to see his mom waving at him through the bay window, smiling from ear to ear. He nodded back and started pedaling towards New Haven Crescent, the lucky estate that would have him as their paperboy for the foreseeable future. In five weeks, he would be able to buy the new top-of-the-range transformer, and with some extra jobs at home, perhaps less. The route was pretty straightforward. His dad had taken him around in the car on Sunday night, and it turned out New Haven Crescent was a retirement village, full of perfectly manicured lawns and dull, pebble-dashed houses. Thankfully, they hadn't come across any vicious hounds of hell, just an extraordinary number of black cats. The place had seemed eerily quiet, though, without a single person walking around or pottering in the garden, or even twitching at the curtains. His dad had said they were all probably at a community event. It was a three-mile bike ride, and no mean feat with a heavy bag of papers around the shoulders, and by the time Jake turned into the street, he already felt a cold stream of sweat running down his back. He dismounted the bike and leaned it against the lamppost, and as he adjusted the heavy orange bag on his shoulders, full to the brim of newspapers, he heard the voice call out, "'Young lad, are you our new paper boy?' He lifted his head to see the white-haired old lady stood in the doorway of number one, and a thousand smart-arse answers filled his head, but he politely replied, yes. Oh, goody, we've been expecting you. It's been four years since the last one. After neatly folding the paper, he walked towards her and handed it over. Old people always seemed like an alien species to him. They were obviously human, but communication with them was limited, and he always felt slightly uncomfortable in their presence. They were nice enough, sometimes grumpy, but he found it hard to believe they were young once, as though all the fun stuff had been siphoned away over time, and they all smelt like TCP and cough drops. She smiled and, in return for the newspaper, handed over twenty pence. "'Thanks, but I already get paid for this,' he said. The old lady's breathing seemed fast and erratic, not awkward but excitable and he noticed that since arriving she had not taken her eyes off him. "'The name is Joan. It's good to meet you, Jake, and call that a bonus.' As he was about to ask how she knew his name, another voice from across the road shouted, "'New paper boy!' And he looked across and saw the door to number two, wide open, and an elderly gentleman beckon him over. "'Thanks, Joan,' he said, and took the coin and made his way across the road." As he reached the path of the old man, he looked back towards Joan House and saw that she was still watching him from the doorway. She quickly shut the door behind her, and almost immediately the curtains twitched. The old man's face looked about two hundred years old, with bits of hair erratically shooting from his nostrils and ears, and his eyebrows looked as though they were trying to escape across the side of his face. He was dancing, doing a little jig. He wasn't Michael Jackson, but he had some moves, Jake mused. Wonderful! Wonderful! It's been so long! Jake held out the paper, and the old man made to grab it, and then snapped his hand back and laughed, and then repeated the sequence three more times before finally clamping his misshapen fingers around the newspaper and snatching it away. The old man then planted his other hand on top of Jake's head and ruffled his hair, a gesture Jake always hated, and even more so when he went to straighten his hair and felt the sticky dampness that remained. He retreated and smiled, and once he was back onto the pavement, he saw that the entire street now had their front doors wide open, with each of the occupiers stood on their doorsteps ready to greet him. Some of them danced excitedly in their doorways. Number three was an old gentleman called Harry, and in exchange for the newspaper, he had given Jake a ten-pence coin. When Jake reached for the reward, the old man had bent down and whispered in his ear, Get as much fanny as you can, lad. Jake nodded and slowly retreated back down the path. He didn't know what to do with that information. 
The closest he got was the underwear section of his mom's catalog, so he decided to bank that little pearl for another day. Number four was a blue rinse named Edith, and she invited him in for a soda and cream bun. He thought he must have been given the luckiest street in town as he wiped the cream mustache away and then glugged some of the soda down, and even though it tasted flat, one almighty burp spluttered out and he immediately put his hand to his mouth. The old lady looked at him and cocked her head from side to side. "'Sorry, excuse me,' he said. She started laughing, then a gentle giggle at first, but then it cranked up a few notches to a full-blown roar, and before long she was rolling on the floor, clutching her belly and guffawing so hard she had tears in her eyes. The subsequent and again involuntary burp from Jake sent her over the edge, struggling to breathe through the raucous laughter. She started to cough violently and profusely, and then her teeth shot out across the wooden floor, and this only caused more hysterics. Jake guessed it was a good five minutes before she finally composed herself and picked up her dentures. "'Sorry, Jake, I'll just pop to the bathroom. I think a bit of wee came out.'" With his opinion of old people upheld, he drank the rest of the soda and went through to the living room and took a look around. An old grandfather clock stood in the corner, ticking loudly. Standing next to it was an old cupboard crammed full of teapots and teacups, and a wooden thimble holder bristled with shades of green and pink just above it. Near the huge, overflowing basket of wool and knitting needles, there were some old photographs on a table near the window. Jake assumed them to be Edith's family. The balloons indicated it was her 90th birthday party, and there were people of various ages crowded around her chair and smiling into her camera. He glanced out the window briefly and saw the old people still patiently waiting in their doorways and thought he'd better get a move on if he wanted to make it back before midnight. As he made his way back to the kitchen, he noticed some old newspapers on the bottom tray of the center table, and he squatted and pulled the first one towards him. "'It won't be long. Don't shoot off just yet,' the voice came from the bathroom. The date on the newspaper was 23rd September 1980. He noted the date on his digital watch as the 22nd and that it was almost four years to the date since publication. "'Jake!' the voice came from behind. "'Hi, I was just looking. Sorry.' It didn't register immediately, and it could have been his mind censoring the image out, but it soon hit him that she was no longer wearing any pants or underwear. She smiled intently at him, batted her eyelids, and asked, "'Do you want to take a photograph, Jake?' At first, he couldn't find his words and focused his eyes on the yellowing textured swirls in the ceiling as he sidestepped back towards the kitchen. "'I have to uh, finish the, the rest of my uh, round now. Thanks for the drink and cake, though!' She laughed, then winked. "'I'm just playing with you, Jake. You can get away with anything when you're old.' He smiled, and as he stepped outside onto the pavement, Edith shouted behind him, "'See you tomorrow, Jake. It's my 90th, you know!' He didn't have the heart to say anything, and if she wanted to believe she'd be turning 90 again, it wasn't his place to ruin that. There was a purpose to his movement now, a need to get home and to be in his room and away from the smells and idiosyncrasies of the old and the oppressive feeling the street was starting to provide. Number five was ready for him, a burly old lady named Janet that made him go inside for another soda and a chat after not taking no for an answer arms of a sumo wrestler pulling him in from the lovely fresh air outside. He counted six black cats in the kitchen, but it smelt like there were more. The house was an unholy cocktail of urine and stale perfume. Jake wanted to be out as soon as he walked in. Janet had frizzy gray hair and a bright red face, the same color as the five stones encrusted onto the star-shaped pendant that draped from her neck. "'You look like you need filling up, boy. Give me a minute,' she said, and then disappeared into the pantry. He looked around and noted the three overflowing cat litter boxes on the floor. He wasn't sure how long he could stand there for without gagging, so he shifted across to the open window. The calendar immediately caught his eye as it swayed gently in the grateful received breeze. The 23rd September had been highlighted in red pen, with the same shape that decorated Janet's neck, a star within a circle. 
He opened the can of cola and took a sip and placed it back down on the counter, unable to stomach any more flat soda. She came back with a box of donuts and offered him one, which he accepted politely but then said he had to be on his way to finish his round. She had looked disappointed as she walked him to the front door, but before he could leave, asked him to wait just one more minute. She came back with a brand spanking new Polaroid camera and took a picture of him and smiled once the print came out. Perfect, she said. She waved him off as he walked down the path and told him that Nana Ivy was looking forward to seeing him. Thirty-five minutes had passed, and he had delivered five papers. Number six was an old man called Jeff that collected his toenail clippings in an old lunchbox. He said he was going to leave them to Jake in his will and then laughed. With his false teeth laid on the palm of his right hand, he proceeded to run through an old ventriloquist act that he said he often did at the community center. Jake wanted to stay 12 years old forever. Number seven was another lady called Clementine, a sweet old lady that had beautiful snow-white hair. She took him through to the kitchen, offered him some candy, the type that was hard on the outside but chewy on the inside, and he spent the majority of their conversation with his fingers in his mouth, trying to pry them from his teeth. She told him she was a widow and married for 62 years before her husband Arthur had died. I'll go and grab a photograph of him. Give me one second. Nana Ivy doesn't let me have them up in the house, but wait here. He looked around the kitchen and noted the calendar with the same star shape surrounding the number 23. No writing adjacent, but it was evident that something was going to happen on that date. Go through to the living room, darling. Make yourself comfortable. He looked at his watch, sighed, and went to sit down on the bright orange sofa. There were pictures of Elvis Presley everywhere and a bookshelf full of photo albums of all shapes and sizes. Just give me a minute. I know it's here somewhere. He took one from the shelf and started flicking through it. There were pictures of Clementine, with who he assumed to be her family, at the seaside and restaurants and various locations with people that looked of a similar age. It was all very boring. He replaced it with one in the middle of the shelf and opened it up halfway to some photographs that had someone's head cut out. One of them showed Clementine smiling and holding hands with a nicely dressed, headless gentleman, who he assumed to be Arthur. He quickly put the album back and peeked through the hallway, but there was no sign of her, so he picked up one from the very end. As he opened it, an old black and white photograph of a baby fell to the floor, and on the back of it, in scrawly handwriting, was written the name Clementine and the date November 1883. Got it! she shouted down the hallway. He collected the photo quickly and slipped it back in the album and shoved it back onto the shelf. This is the only one I have, but please don't tell anyone as they will take it away from me. Why? He couldn't help himself. Oh, it's hard to explain, Jake. The short story is he didn't want to be a part of the community anymore and they gave me an ultimatum, him or them. She kissed the photograph then and turned a smile at Jack and then continued. It sounds harsh, Jake, I know, but if you knew what I knew, then it would make sense. The woman in front of him had apparently been on the planet for over 100 years. Jack would have guessed about 80 at a shot, so she was doing something right. He thanked her for the candy and said he had to be on his way. As he left, the old lady reminded him, please don't tell Nana Ivy. I won't, he said, and smiled and left for number eight. On his visit to the next few houses, he was offered chocolate and crisps, even a blowjob from Doris at number 23, and he put that one down to dementia. Benjamin was waiting for him at number 64, and he was wearing an old gas mask at the doorway. It reminded him of Darth Vader, and even more so when the old guy spoke in a low, guttural voice, "'I am your father, Jake,' and then laughed hysterically. He took off the gas mask to reveal an olive-skinned face, completely bald, and eyes that pointed in slightly different directions. Forcefully, he began pushing Jake through the door and took him into the front room that was decorated wall-to-wall -wall with war memorabilia. An old gun in a glass case hung above the fireplace. 
and pictures of spitfires decorated the yellow walls. Various cupboards and tables were crammed full of plastic models of the same plane, and even one made of matchsticks took centerpiece on the coffee table in the middle of the lounge. "'Took me all day to do that one,' he said as he handed Jake a can of soda. "'It's cool, Benjamin,' he said, genuinely impressed. "'Call me Ben,' he said, and winked. "'I've got more of the matchstick models if you're interested.' "'Yes, please.' His new friend Ben disappeared eagerly out of the room, and he put the soda on the coffee table and surveyed the lounge. In the corner was an overflowing wicker magazine rack, crammed full of yellow newspapers and magazines, and the first thing he pulled out was an old TV Times from 1972, and behind it was a newspaper, dated 23rd, September 1980. There were some older issues shoved behind it, but what caught his eye was the huge red book that rested diagonally against the side of the bookcase above. An embossed circle encased a star with five points and suggested a significance of some sorts. He picked up the book and opened it, and immediately the yellowed pages and stale smell gave him the impression the book was incredibly old. The wording wasn't English, but a mixture of texts and symbols that meant nothing to Jake. There was a piece of paper sticking out of the book towards the middle, and he flicked to the relevant page to reveal the black and white print of a young boy. On the back of the picture, someone had written Tommy in the year 1980. When Ben came back in and saw Jake looking at the box, his demeanor and mood instantly changed. I think you better leave now, son. I don't like snoops. Sorry, Ben. I was just interested. I really want to see the models you've made. The name is Benjamin, kiddo, he said as he snatched the book away. Now, off with you. There was a pause, and he half expected the old man to start laughing, but his face remained stern all the way to the front door, and most likely once it had slammed shut behind him. On his way to the next house, he collected his thoughts and assumed Tommy was someone precious to the old man, perhaps a grandson. He was disappointed as he'd been genuinely interested in the modeling and was upset that the old codger had kicked him out. It had been one hell of a day, and one hell of a welcome, and he made a note to try and start being friendly but firm. The watch indicated it was already 6.20 and he had to get on with the round, otherwise his dad would be out looking for him and he wanted to finish the job as he started, on his own. Finally, after a few more meet-and-greets and and exchanges of newspapers for candy and the polite refusal of up-teen cans of no-doubt flat soda, he reached Nana Ivy's house. More of The Paper Boy by Mark Taus when Weird Darkness returns. Say ho, ho, ho! Hey, weirdos, our next Weirdo Watch Party is Saturday, December 11th. Horror host Mistress Malicious is back, and she brings her entourage of miscreants from Mistress Peace Theater for an insanely fun Christmas episode. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians from 1964, starring Pia Zadora and Santa Claus. The Martians kidnap Santa Claus because there's nobody on Mars to give their children presents. Join us for this atrociously bad movie, jump into the chat with us to poke fun at the acting, the sets, man to make jokes as we watch the film, and let's all celebrate Christmas with a really weird and wacky film hosted by a really weird and wacky woman. The Weirdo Watch Party is free, so grab your movie popcorn, candy, and soda and join us Saturday, December 11th. The film starts at 9 p.m. Central, that's 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film and also learn more about The Weirdo Watch Party on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. He knew it was Nana Ivy's house, as it had a plaque on the wall saying it was. The garden was full of strange objects, lots of stone frogs and gargoyle-type creatures, even a small statue of what looked to be a leprechaun holding his little pickle and spraying water into a garden bed, the strangest little fountain Jake had ever seen. On the front of the glossy red door, there was a black star with a circle running around it 
just like on the calendars. Three more black cats monopolized the doorstep, lounging in the evening sun. They eyed him briefly and stretched and then went back to their sleep. He was relieved there was nobody there to greet him, and he folded the paper neatly and put it into the letterbox in the front door. Immediately it was snatched from the other side, and the door swung open, revealing a large lady with the biggest smile he'd seen all day and more jewelry around her neck than Mr. T. Jake! she roared. He stood dumbfounded at the door and tried to speak, but before he could, she put her big hands on his tiny shoulders and dragged him in through the front door. Don't be shy, boy, I'm Nana Ivy. Uh, hi, he replied sheepishly. The hallway was abundant with all sorts of obscure art, paintings displaying the screaming faces of demons, statues of contorted figures with various limbs missing, and more of those symbols hung on the walls with metallic rings housing the five-pointed stars. Center stage and resting on the sideboard, surrounded by a dozen or so lit candles, was a black-and-white photograph of the entire community all of them holding hands around the same large circular symbol. He recognized the faces that were visible, and of course next to Edith was the smudged-out face of her husband, Arthur, the outcast. "'Come through, boy!' she insisted. The smell of scented candles drifted through the house, and it wasn't unpleasant. As he walked through to the kitchen, even after all the candy and soda, the smell was mouth-watering. Do you like apple pie?" Two pieces later, and under the watchful eye of Nana Ivy, he said he had to be going and thanked her a million times for the pie. She laughed it off, but before he even made an effort to get out of his seat, her big hands clamped around his shoulders once again and asserted the fact that she wasn't finished with him just yet. She went to sit in the chair opposite and then looked directly at him until he started to feel uncomfortable and shift around. Do you like cards? she asked. Yes, I play fish with my dad sometimes, and he's teaching me how to play gin rummy, too. She took the pack from her trouser pocket, opened it, and placed the cards face down on the table. The cards were larger and looked heavier and more cardinal than others he had seen. When Anna Ivy shooed his hand away, that was made even more apparent. She shuffled and asked Jack to pick five. He did and she looked the cards over and nodded and then put them back in the pack. "'Did I win?' he asked. "'You win another piece of pie to take with you tonight,' Nana Ivy replied and winked. She cut him another slice and wrapped it in the kitchen roll and slipped it into his orange bag. "'Hey, young Jake, what is your favorite pie, and I'll cook another one for you tomorrow?' "'Um, have to be Blackberry, Ivy,' he replied. "'It's Nana Ivy,' she correctly sterned. Sorry, uh, Nana Ivy. She smiled and patted him on his head. Good lad, I will have one ready for you tomorrow. He said goodbye and walked back to collect his bike. Even though there was urgency in his step, he could still make out the twitching curtains as he walked by the houses. Once he sat in the saddle, he gave one last look back and saw what looked to be an entire street staring back at him from their lounge room windows. He shivered and sped off into the evening and back to his home where nobody was over the age of 50. As soon as he got back to his house, he let his Raleigh grifter fall to the ground on the front lawn and rushed up the front steps. He never paid much attention to the home sweet home welcome mat before, but tonight he had to agree. In the kitchen, his mom and dad were eating dinner. "'I was just about to come and get you, champ,' said his dad. "'I know. I'm sorry,' he said." and then sighed, old people, and shook his head. His mom and dad laughed, and then his mom said, we're proud of you, Jake. Thanks, mom. So how was it? His dad asked. It was fine, he replied. I'm beat now, though. There's spaghetti in the pan. You'll need to warm it up, and there are two slices of cold toast on the side, his dad replied. We didn't realize you'd be so long. What kept you, anyway? He thought about telling them for a second, but decided he didn't have the energy. And besides, he wouldn't know where to begin. Would he lead with the eviction from the old farts house, or the lady who weed herself and then asked Jake to take a picture of her privates, or would it be the sexual favors promised by number 23? I'm actually not hungry. Can I go to my room? Sure thing, boss, his dad said softly. Are you okay? 
A bit tired, he replied. His feet were very sore, but his stomach was doing somersaults from the epic amounts of candy and cakes he had destroyed. Once upstairs, he sat at his desk and opened the catalog to the page with the corner folded over and admired the shiny metallic transformer. There was a huge sense of achievement as he wiped off one of the lines from the tally on the chalkboard above his desk. Only another twenty or so days and he'll be able to buy it outright, and with his own cash. He took the magazine onto his bed, and it was good to rest his weary feet. His stomach soon began to settle, and before long he was fast asleep. It was time again, homework done and day two of his paper route. The plan was simple, pass and move, don't engage, be friendly but intentional. He leaned his bike against the same lamppost as the day before and looked to the street ahead. No movement at all, just like the day his dad had driven through the area. There was no sign of twitching curtains, no eager old people jigging up and down impatiently. It was like a ghost town. With first newspaper in hand, he made his way to Joan's house and half expected the door to fly open as he approached. He kept his eyes on the bay window as he walked up the path, watching for any signs of movement. And even after pushing the paper through the letterbox and his hasty retreat down the path, he hadn't expected to get away with it. On to number two, and the old guy with the sticky hands and the two furry friends that lived above his eyes. But again, no twitching curtains and no sign that anyone was home. Number three was the same, and no sign of pissy pants at number four. The thought crossed his mind that he could be finished in twenty minutes and without trauma. He ran from house to house, expertly rolling the papers and threading them through the letterboxes without a single encounter. He took the last paper from his bag and walked up the path to Nana Ivy's front door. On the welcome mat outside was a plate with a slab of pie, and next to it was a little piece of paper with his name on it, Blackberry Pie written on the back. The aroma was amazing. A heady cocktail of summer fruit and sugar pastry, and even after the pig out yesterday, Jake felt immediately ravenous. He put the empty orange bag down, sat down on the doormat, and scooped it up to find it freshly warm from the oven, or at the very least recently reheated. The fluffy pastry caved, and the deep richness of the fruit exploded into his mouth, and it was heavenly. In his twelve years on the planet to date, he had never tasted anything so exquisite and felt extremely disappointed as he put the last piece in his mouth and licked his fingers. He picked up the bag and made his way back toward his bike. He had only walked a few steps back before he realized the bike was missing and no longer leaning against the lamppost where he left it. His pace quickened as panic set in at the thought of the long walk back home and the fact his dad would go nuts as the bike was only a few months old. He'd had visions of being home well before six and ample time to watch TV and play, especially after the late finish last time. He made it about halfway to the pole before the world started spinning and his legs gave way, and as he fell to the ground, he just managed to put his hands out in time to avoid a face full of tarmac. His body felt immediately heavy, as did his eyes, and all of a sudden he was completely exhausted. As he let his face rest against the ground, the houses started to swim around, but were quickly flooded away by a river of darkness. There was a sound of chairs scraping on the floor when he woke up, an urgency in the voices that surrounded him. His head pounded, and the chairs made it exponentially worse. Slowly, he opened his eyes and soon recognized the familiar faces of New Haven Crescent busying around him in what he assumed to be the community hall in preparation for something. The chairs were all facing his direction. He tried to get up, but realized he was bound to the chair with what looked like a mile of yarn, and as he clumsily bucked to and fro, he saw the star on the ground in front of him and the familiar ring that circled it. There was a little candle on each point of the star, and in its center were black and white prints of two young boys with the word missing in bold text on the bottom of each poster, and on one of them he made out the name Tommy. Jack recognized him as the boy from the photograph that had slipped out of the heavy red book. He then saw the smaller photograph of himself 
the one that Janet had taken in between the two large ones. How long have we got? A voice asked. We managed to keep him over an hour yesterday. Don't worry, we have plenty of time, someone replied. The drum started then, and immediately people took to their seats. The pain in his head synchronized perfectly with the beat to make the effect even more dramatic. He looked toward the audience and saw the birthday girl with the balloons tied to her chair, and she smiled and waved at him. There was a buzz of excitement that reminded him of a school assembly as the old people chatted and waited for further direction. A strange smell, a sort of sickly sweet burning started to waft towards him, and it wasn't long before the source became apparent. Nana Ivy came running through the door, completely naked, of course, and holding out in front of her some plant or herb that was smoldering away. She was chanting in a language Jake didn't recognize, and he guessed it was the strange text that he had seen in the embossed red book. Each member of the audience started to embrace her, and once she had wafted the plant in front of them, they bowed and kissed her feet. She headed for Jake then and danced around him, her breasts bounding only inches away from his face in a violent, pendulous motion. He closed his eyes and winced as she came up close and kissed him on the forehead. "'Let's hear it for Jake, everybody!' she shouted. The hall filled with applause and a few whistles. Someone heckled, "'Snoop!" and he didn't need two guesses on that one. Once the applause died down, Nana Ivy walked into the center of the circle, knelt down, and kissed each of the photographs. Jake was terrified. Something big was going to happen, and it appeared he was the main attraction. He missed his mom and dad. He wanted to be home, and he felt the first tear run down his cheek. Jake, please don't cry, Nana Ivy said. This is your destiny. We've been waiting so long, and the cards never lie. I want to go home, he whimpered, finally managing to find some sort of voice. Jake, take some comfort from the longevity you're going to provide this beautiful community. Our pact held with our good Lord Satan will ensure we will all be rewarded with the last four years of our lives in return for yours. He started to sob then, uncontrollably. It had to be some sick joke. The word please left his lips. Jake, we're a community and we look out for each other and sometimes we have to do drastic things to protect ourselves. We are part of something strong, and in the last 20 years, we have only lost one person. Perhaps it would be more appropriate to say that he lost his way. She turned her head and winked towards Edith. This ritual allows us to continue in our group and thrive, and by offering young blood, we can gain extra time we wouldn't normally have. Most of us in this room are over a hundred Earth years old. She put her hand on Jake's cheek and wiped away the tear. It's time, she said. Nana Ivy walked across to the other side of the room and disappeared out of Jake's vision. When she came back, she was wearing a demonic mask like the one Jake had seen in her hallway and carrying a plate with a piece of pie. The combination of the two large horns protruding from the top of the forehead and the blood-red painted eyes was more than Jake could take. He started screaming then and rocking back and forth. He was foaming at the mouth as he threw himself around in desperation. She reached behind her back and pulled the large knife out. The drumming started again, and then Nana Ivy leaned in close and held the piece of pie out to Jake. It's best you eat more pie now, Jake, she whispered in his ear. The dampness was immediate and he felt the warmth creeping across the front of his shorts. A voice shouted across the room, "'See, even young folks piss themselves!' And he knew it was Edith. Nana Ivy placed the blade against his neck and leaned in once more. "'It really is best if you eat the pie now, Jake.' He took a bite. It was still good somehow. Even with death looming and mixed with salty tears, it still tasted so damn good." Do you want a quick blowjob as a last request? Doris piped up and removed her teeth to make a smacking sound with her lips. The hall filled with raucous laughter. 
Jake slowly began to slip into darkness as the crowd began singing happy birthday to Edith. His last thoughts were of his family and the stupid Transformer toy that he'd wished he'd never seen. Thanks for listening to this Dark Archives episode of Weird Darkness. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and more, including the show's Weirdos Facebook group, on the contact social page at WeirdDarkness.com. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, click on Tell Your Story or call the Dark Line toll-free at 1-877-277-5944. That's 1-877-277-5944. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a copyright and trademark of Marlar House Productions. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Want to receive the commercial-free version of Weird Darkness every day? For just $5 per month, you can become a patron at WeirdDarkness.com. As a patron, you get commercial-free episodes of Weird Darkness every day, bonus audio, and you also receive chapters of audiobooks as I narrate them, even before the authors and publishers hear them. But more than that, as a patron, you're also helping to reach people who are desperately hurting with depression and anxiety. You get the benefits of being a patron, and you also benefit others who are hurting at the same time. Become a patron at WeirdDarkness.com. <laughs>